This is every Minecraft skill you need to learn today. A water bucket MLG is a very common skill. So common that I doubt many of you even need to learn how to master it at this point. It's kind of just old hat. But what might be an even more impressive, albeit contextual MLG, is pulling off this one with a horse. Yeah, because unlike the water bucket, not only do we have to be in the right place, but the horse does too. Which is a lot harder to coordinate when you're falling from the sky and you're not exactly there with a golden carrot to bait it over. But when you pull it off, you can land on the moving horse and be completely safe from all falls damage. And you'll also have a friend to celebrate once you land, which is nothing to be understated. But what if you don't want a horse to travel with, but rather a boat? Well, you could always make one <laughs> midair and then land in that after you craft it midair, saving yourself from all fall damage and looking very cool when you do it. And when you watch Dream pull it off real time, it does look impossible. And I wouldn't say it's far from it, but my friend RecRap was able to study doing this on his single player world. And there, the lag's even less than it would be in a multiplayer server. And I mean, for him, it went on to become his most popular video, so I'd say that was a skill worth learning, and I think you should try to learn it too. Amongst Minecraft parkour, there's been few things as famous as the fabled five block jump. I mean, at this point, if you see a pattern like this and someone jumping in the thumbnail, you can pretty much guarantee they're gonna talk about it. But the real truth is that it actually is possible to jump five blocks. You'll just need a very specific setup. And after building up enough momentum, if you time it just right and jump at the last pixel of the block, you could learn how to rocket yourself over to the other side. Which I don't think you're gonna find practical if you wanna use this to jump over ravines in the real game. But to do it once and said that you did the impossible, I think that's plenty worth doing. Because really, if you wanna get over gaps that are long longer than five blocks in length, you're better off just learning how to speed bridge. And not only will you find this useful in something like Bed Wars, but if you got enough spare blocks, it also could help you out quite a bit if you're getting chased by mobs in survival. At the very least, it makes it just a little bit less annoying to find yourself in Elytra if you're able to go over the end void gap like this. And speaking of getting to the end, how fast can you beat Minecraft? Normally when we start servers with our friends when we get that two week Minecraft binge, we tend to do this Ender Dragon fight pretty quick. But are you able to speed run Minecraft in under an hour, which sounds like a lot, but really, even on a random seed with just the right amount of luck, if you know a couple of speedrunner tips like knowing how to build the portal right or quick craft, that could be all you need to get your time underneath an hour. Which not only is impressive enough to say that you can speedrun the game, but it also could help you get an even earlier start onto that new world. <laughs> Let's be honest, a lot of the game opens up when you get an elytra, so the sooner that you're able to get it, the better. And the cooler you look, too. If you aim just right, you could be able to hit yourself and actually get a surprising amount of momentum going, even moving yourself along faster than sprinting alone. And in a PvP situation, this could be able to help you get out of a pinch much faster. Like double jumping over gorges. It's really cool. But in fairness, the amount of damage that you're taking from those few arrow shots is substantially less than you would have been taking from the bad guy right behind you. And also less than you would have taken from falling into that pit. So I feel like both of those are pretty good. All right, so we already talked about the impossible five block jump being possible. So what's the hardest jump in Minecraft? And for my money, I would think I'd have to say the triple Neo block jump. The idea here is that we have a three block wall that's blocking us from getting to the other side of this path. And as Legitimus can show you, with just the right amount of timing and precision to your jumps, you are able to scale around the outside of this wall. You're just gonna wanna tear your hair out as you're learning how to do it. But that said, if you got yourself a day and you wanna learn how to do this skill, it could make you way better at parkour if you're able to pull this off. And if you got a knack for rhythm games, you might find that to be an applicable skill here, because the timing really is everything. But once you're able to pull it off and stick the landing, it doesn't matter how much time it took for you to learn this one, you'll be happy that you arrived at all. Most PvP servers exist on pre-combat update versions of the game. And because of that, that means you should learn this old skill, since it's still pretty useful today. The idea is that you're gonna have to use a fishing rod in combat. And not as your weapon of choice, but rather to make your weapon even more of a good choice. Since the way that the invulnerability period works in Minecraft is by ignoring damage that's the same or lower than the damage that caused it. So if you hit a player or a mob with a sword, that'll activate their invulnerability, meaning that for half a second, no other damage can happen. However, that's only when we attack with the sword first. Since if you were to hit the player with the fishing rod first, then when you hit them by the sword, it doesn't trigger the invulnerability because the sword does more damage to the fishing rod bobber, which can then allow you to hit them once again once the rod's invulnerability is worn off. And at that point, we've essentially done two hits in the amount of time that it would normally take to do one. <laughs> at that point, all I can say is ouch. This jump might look impossible, and frankly it should be, but with the help of something called blip jumping, we're able to learn how to jump more than two blocks vertically. Since when you align yourself to a specific pixel in a chest or an ender chest, and then start jamming down your space button, you can use a specific setup to learn how to jump much higher than normal. And honestly, I'd want to learn how to do this skill just so I can get out of dodge from this ugly setup. I mean, an orange carpet, sandstone, and an ender chest? I mean, it's definitely a look, but it's not a look for me. 
When you fly with an elytra, you're able to fit through a one-by-one -one space. And a setup like this with multiple rings that get progressively smaller and smaller will prove that, especially if you're flying faster. At that point, it's hard to even tell what a ring is, let alone if you're flying through it. And then if you add in having to turn into the rings, that'll also greatly increase the difficulty. But by increasing the difficulty like that, it does make it a more impressive skill to learn. So if you're looking to show off your elytra course to your friends next time you're flying through on the server, this is a good way to do it. Landing a water bucket clutch is already pretty tough, but how do you do a water Water bucket clutch when you don't have a water bucket, at least not yet. See, the idea here is that we have our water bucket placed as an item partway down our descent, and all we're gonna be equipped with is a fishing rod. So if you get the timing right, you can hook the water bucket, pull it into your inventory, and then use that as a standard water bucket clutch. But that's a lot easier said than done. Not only is it tough to land your hook on top of the water bucket, but you also have to know the proper time to reel it in. But pull it all together, it does look really cool. Figuring out how note blocks work is already pretty tough, but then to take that skill and not only be able to play these note blocks in the right order, but do it entirely without redstone by yourself, that's a whole other skill. But as you can see from these examples, it really is cool to learn. And at that point, you'd have to remember a lot of different things to get this to come together. Not just memorize the sequence of notes that you have to play, but also which of the blocks you need to punch, and at what time you need to punch them. But as soon as you put all that effort into learning it, it's something you're never gonna give up. Under normal circumstances, we can never make this jump. But with a few blocks in our hand, we can actually make that happen. See, the idea here is that for this trick, you have to place multiple blocks, around two or three, to reach the other side safely. And then, mid-air, we're gonna be placing those blocks on the edge, so then, while we couldn't have made the original jump, we can now make it this way. And really think of this like an MLG water bucket save on steroids. You have to right-click at the right time, multiple times. But if you pull it together, it's a good way to get away in a chase scene. Getting to the nether is a big step in your Minecraft journey. But what if we took that big step a couple steps earlier? Since as soon as you have enough iron for a bucket, that's all you need to get yourself to the nether as soon as possible. You're just gonna have to take a look at speedrunners to how to do it. First, you'll find a lava lake, and then by placing down building blocks for the structure just right, we can use flowing water so that we can make our lava into obsidian, and that way we have another portal frame without having any access to diamonds. But just be warned, the sooner that you get to the nether, the less prepared you're gonna be. So I'd also take a page out of speedrunners books for how to survive the nether once you get over there. And speaking of speedrunner tech, we don't just have to save that for the nether, we could also use it in the end. Since while the ender dragon fight's supposed to be the big culminating moment of your run, when you can do it this fast with only a few beds, it really makes the whole thing seem like a wash. But believe me, being able to kill the ender dragon this fast with this many beds, that's a whole journey to learn in its own right. But once you learn the hitboxes while it's perching, you can make sure to get a headshot on the dragon four to six times and swiftly one cycle the thing. Just make sure you're placing the beds like this on top of the end portal. Otherwise, you you could also be one cycling yourself, and something tells me that's not as impressive on a leaderboard. Normally we use an MLG water bucket to save ourselves from a high fall, but what about a low fall? Or rather to say, the lowest possible distance that you can fall underneath the world. Since if you were to set up shulkers and boats in the void, we can't actually make a platform that's 67 blocks underneath the world's surface. And then, if we were to fall from world height, that would be a 447 block drop, which is gonna take a while to fall. So remember that once you get close to the bottom, you are supposed to press right click to get yourself into one of those boats. After all, it'd be pretty embarrassing to set all this up and then die in a place where it's almost impossible to get your stuff back. Maybe do a little bit of practice before we try this one. Normally, we're not supposed to be able to jump more than four to five blocks horizontally, but with an ice bridge and the right timings, we could jump that number up to eight blocks horizontal leap. And the way to do this is to have ice beneath us and trap doors overhead so that we have the minimal amount of space to jump. And then once we span that jump key as we're sprinting along, that allows us to get even higher speeds. But all that mashing jump isn't gonna cut it, since we also have to time it out just right so that the very last jump happens at the very end of the last block. If it doesn't, then you'll just be falling even faster into the gap. So make sure to get the timing right and the spamming right to pull this all together to reach the other side. Minecraft has boats, but it doesn't have planes. At least, not yet. We're all capable of putting those five wooden planks into better use in the sky. First, you want to get into third person mode with F5. And then at that point, if you get in and out of the boat repeatedly while you're falling, you're able to slow down its velocity to a snail's pace. And the reason this works is that every time you get out of the boat, it cancels its current velocity. But what's even better is that you don't just have to use this for falling slow, you can also use it for moving a wider horizontal distance. And that's why you'll see speedrunners putting this to use if they need to save themselves on a run. Or in Dream's case, you can use it to save yourself when you're running away from your friends. In Bedrock Edition, there's a technique called downfalling. The idea specifically here is that you're going to throw an ender pearl and then attempt to pillar downwards to save yourself. So you'd start on a platform, jump off, and then throw an ender 
Center Pearl at the underside of the platform. At that point, you quickly swap over to Blocks, and then try to spam down as many of them as you can to make the pillar. Once you do that, you can Ender Pearl glitch into the pillar, or place a block off to the side of the pillar to land on it. And while the steps to do it sound like a lot when you sound them all out, when you watch this happen in real time, it actually goes pretty fast. So if you plan on learning it, maybe break it down a little bit before you do. Ghost blocks aren't usually a helpful thing in Minecraft. Normally, they're an annoyance when you're breaking blocks, and then all of a sudden you're running into invisible barriers. But with the help of scaffolding, we can use this to our advantage. See, when standing on top of scaffolding and spamming down enough of these with the right click, you'll eventually be left with one scaffolding floating off in the distance. And while we can see it, no one else can, giving us a ghost block that we can essentially fly around on. But if you're gonna try this, be careful of which server you do it on. Since while we think the magic carpet's cool, Mojang's cheat detection can see this as flying, and you'll get kicked from the server if flying's not enabled. With the help of a respawn anchor and an end crystal, we're gonna be able to follow after Rasplin's advice and do a PvP combo that's so complex, even watching it play out, it's hard to understand what happens. So let's break it down a bit. The idea here is that we're using a respawn anchor in the overworld, and then when we load it with a glowstone and allow it to detonate, we're bouncing our enemy off of that respawn anchor explosion into an end crystal, and that way delivering the killing blow. And if you've ever looked into end crystal PvP, you'll understand that the button mashing is very similar here than what it is to that. Unless you're really in a dire situation where you need to take care of your enemy with a lot of armor, I can't see much of a reason to put this into place. But it does look cool when you put it in a YouTube video, so if that's what you want to learn it for, that's fine by me. In Minecraft, we worry a lot about insta mining and not insta crafting, but ask any speed runner and you can know that stack crafting can be just as useful of a skill. And the idea here is that you place more than one item in certain slots, so then when you shift click out all the result items, you'll craft multiple different items in one go. And you can see common examples of this with tools or armor. But even just knowing all the different number hotkeys that allow you to quick craft like speedrunners do, that not only takes a lot of memorization, but it also takes a lot out of your fingers. But luckily there are servers that allow you to test this, so if you really want to learn it, they'll let you get there. If you've ever watched a speedrun and you see the speedrunner change their FOV like this, it's actually for good reason. Since when you look at the F3 debug screen, you can actually see spikes in entities depending on what your field of view is. So by narrowing your vision down to a low FOV, we can pinpoint where there might be large spikes of entities. And when you're in the nether, this could be a good indication of a bastion remnant being in that direction. Since usually, piglins, piglin brutes, and hoglins will all spawn upon generation in bastion remnants. And they won't despawn naturally, meaning that when you look in the direction of one, you're gonna to see more mobs spiking up in your F3 debug than in the surrounding areas. And it's not just good for finding things in the nether, since if you get really specific with the pie chart that you're looking at, you could actually use this to find specific rooms within the stronghold. And honestly, I think it's a skill at all to be able to play the game for a second at low FOV. It just looks hideous. But to then be able to use it to basically look through walls and find things, that's pretty cool. And it could help you out as soon as you learn it. This might look like a fall to certain death, and really, it will be. Unless you're able to land in the one pixel worth of water coming from this waterlogged chest. And the reason it's exactly one pixel is that chests are exactly one pixel smaller than a block on all sides. And if you really want to make this trick seem even more impressive visually, then you can let the water flow as far as possible into the chest corner so that it's also as thin as it possibly could be. And at this point, I just think it's funny that this near microscopic amount of water is able to break our fall up well, something like a cauldron's never been able to. And honestly, if it gives me another opportunity to call out the cauldron for being a bad block, that's a worthwhile skill in its own right. If you're able to find a magma ravine out in the ocean, then that's all you need to make yourself into a speedrunner. Now, what you're looking for here is a three block L shape of the magma blocks. And then when you break one of the magma blocks and place the door in the hole that you just made, that allows us to breathe at the bottom of the ocean to build the rest of the portal. From there, we place down the two other doors that we crafted on the far side of the two magma blocks. And then by placing a block and breaking another one of the magma blocks, we'll have easy access to the lava underneath to start building ourselves a portal. And just like that, we turn what would have just been a couple of bubbles at the bottom of a ravine into our new gateway into the nether. <laughs> Come on, it looks pretty cool when you do it so fast. Here's how to beat the warden using just some wool blocks. Now, as you might know, wool can be used to deafen the sound that comes from the vibrations, which if we take that to the logical extreme, if we then place wool around a warden as it's climbing out of the ground while spawning, we'll be able to make it both trapped and oblivious to what's happening around it, which at that point means we can walk around the perimeter and then it'll despawn after time when it doesn't get any stimulus. It's a bold move, but it can work out if you've got the right skills. Instead of using fireworks rockets, why not try a dolphin? Silly as it sounds, there is a way to use dolphin's grace for a boost while you're flying. Simply attach a lead to a dolphin, swim underwater, and then start flying for that speed boost. And if you get it down just right, you're even able to build up enough momentum underwater to launch yourself right out of the ocean. Just make sure not to drop your dolphin while you're up there. Pigs and carrots are not exactly a popular form of travel by any stretch of the imagination. Well, 
but what they lack in land speed, these porker pariahs might just make up for in the skies. As it turns out, by switching on and off of a carrot on a stick item while riding on the swine, it can actually cause the mob to fall slower. This pork parachute might actually save you in a future manhunt. But before you go and try this out with your local pig, you might want to keep this in mind. As soon as you get close to the ground, you have to be off the pig before you land. Otherwise, it's going to be you as a pile of items right next to that dead pork job. Building a floating house, an airship, or even a UFO are all great projects to try. But when you're building them, they all come with the same problem. That is, when you need to build freestanding blocks in the sky, it can be real annoying to replace the ones if you mess up. So to save yourself from doing this whole song and dance just to fix it, it's worth your while to just do this instead. See, all it takes is pressing both the right and left click button at the same time to change out a block like that. And what's better still is that this can be used quickly to change the orientation of a midair stair, which is definitely appreciated. If you accidentally started a raid, you should just dig down. And the reason is because a three block hole will still let you attack a ravager that's over top while staying completely safe from any of its damage. Which is good because if you're over on ground, these mobs can chase you pretty quickly. But from down here, you're able to finish the job using nothing more than stone tools. Or if you have more blocks on hand, just build up eight, place a trap door, and that little bit of crawling will let you get close enough to hit it without it being able to look up and hit you. Both of which are much appreciated. Without breaking any blocks, how would you get out of this hole? Well, silly as it seems, a door is actually the solution. And maybe the best one. Since if you place down a door and then flip it back and forth, you'll be able to hop up the steps of the door and go up two blocks at a time, which can be exceptionally useful for helping you get out of a hole or an animal pad. And that way, any of the other mobs that are trapped in there with you, they won't be able to hop up the blocks while you're pillaring out to escape. With your Riptide Trident, we can go up to 200 blocks into the sky. And the way we do this is that if we wait for a rainstorm and then continuously bounce off a slime block bounce pad, each time that we bounce back down, we'll launch higher than the last, which in turn gets us more momentum, and we can continue to do this until we reach so high in the sky that the rain becomes snow, meaning we're so high up in the atmosphere that it starts to get cold up there. And while it's all fun and games, just make sure that you actually land on the slime block when you're ready to come down. We don't need to go from your highest high down to your lowest low. Animal husbandry is a cornerstone of the Minecraft experience, but while it's straightforward to move a bunch of sheep or cattle, it's sometimes tedious. I mean, I doubt many of us are walking around with weed at all times. I'm definitely not. So to fix those pigs who got out of the pen, we could solve this simply by using a flint and steel. Sure enough, when lit on fire, these mobs are coated a path fine to the nearest water source, meaning a system like this is sure to have them relocate themselves, just as long as they don't become pork chops in the process. Anvil costs can get annoying pretty fast. I mean, all it takes is a few enchanted books in the wrong order, and bam, it's too expensive to use. And this can get remarkably frustrating when you go to repair something. So before you find yourself in that hassle, maybe try this. Apparently, by just renaming the tool every time you go to repair, it's enough to stop the repair cost from jacking up each time. At that point, the game treats it as a simple name change operation and forgets the rest. Just some minor change like adding a space or a number to the end is good enough. It does not need to be fancy, trust me. Looting desert temples is a fun pastime for sure, but what if you're trying to get the valuables without wasting your precious time? Well, that's where this method comes in. See, while most of us would just spend the seconds to individually loot each and every one of these chests, this user's method is a lot more straightforward. And instead, we use the TNT from the trap below to blow up the chamber and the chest with it. And while that sounds dangerous, it's worth noting that by standing in the pit down here, it'll let us survive with barely a scratch sustained. And afterwards, we'll not only have all that treasure in our inventory, but a ton of blocks to build our way out as well. Say you want to fill up a huge cube of water. Maybe for an aquarium, a squid farm, whatever your purpose is, I won't judge. You just need a big chunk of water filled in with source blocks. If that's the case, here's a method that's sure to save you some time. By placing columns of water source blocks in a pattern like this and then updating them, then soon enough, you'll get the entire area filled just like that. Which is definitely a lot less pain than trying to fill up every single block with just a handful of buckets. All you're going to need is some kelp, some precision, and enough time to make sure that this entire desert turns into a regular oasis. Nobody likes silverfish. They don't have a special drop or anything, so there's no incentive to kill them. So at the very least, if we have to deal with them, how about we make it a bit easier to get rid of them? And while swinging at them with a sword does work, that's almost guaranteeing that a few of their friends are going to join the fray. So to prevent that, let's use a flint and steel instead. By burning the suckers, it's treated as environmental damage, and that'll keep the rest of their buddies at bay. Look, I wouldn't exactly say it makes fighting them a joy, but if you're giving me the choice of fighting just one or an entire dozen, I'd rather just fry the guy. Water travel is a funny thing in Minecraft, because on one hand, Mojang's added plenty of different ways to travel the ocean, what with conduits, dolphins, and boats. But on those other occasions where you're stuck to go in one block deep water in the swamp or something, it could be a real chore. That is, unless you got a bucket in hand. As it turns out, looking down with an empty bucket and holding right click is actually faster than normal moving. Yeah, I guess those brief moments of dry air really do make a difference. This might save you some valuable 
seconds when you're going around getting chased in shallow pools. Finding a buried treasure map is cause for a celebration, but locating the buried treasure on that map is something of a chore. And most of the time, I feel like I need to excavate half of the coast before I finally find the thing. So to simplify that task down and make it quicker to reach our goal, this is a helpful guide to keep in mind. See, after you align yourself so that the white indicator points at the bottom of the red X, then all we need to do is move forward so that just one pixel of white peeks out underneath, like so. Which might seem awkward, but from here, the chest will always be exactly one block north of you. In a game called Minecraft, you're gonna be spending a lot of your time I'm mining. I mean, what did you expect? So to speed up that trip in the caves, it's worth keeping this in mind. See, on Bedrock, it's actually true that if you click each block while mining it, instead of holding down the button, you'll mine substantially faster. And while that might seem like a marginal difference on a small job, this can really start to add up on a big project. And why does this happen? I'm not quite sure, but the same thing does happen in Java Edition's creative mode, so I guess it's a common enough problem. Building in survival is obviously tougher than it is in creative mode, and part of that is the need for temporary blocks like dirt or scaffolding to reach certain angles. And while those do work, they do add in another step of cleanup to the process. So to handle this a bit more elegantly, why not try out the 1.17 powdered snow bucket instead? Using one of these, we can get a block that not only we can place down for support, but also pick up for easy reuse. Just make sure to wear your leather boots. Otherwise, it won't do much good for support. Exploring the new caves that generate in 1.18 is a real treat. But while they're fun to explore, exploring them safely is a different story. So to make it to the base of that ravine with both your legs intact, weaving vines are the best answer. See, with these, we can hang one off of the roof and then bone meal it to reach the bottom. And that not only gives us a way to reach the base of the cave safely, but it also offers easy access back to the top. And that kind of dual purpose can be a real lifesaver. When you first boot up your world, many of us probably have on our to-do list first thing is to get wood. But as you're going about taking that task off your list, what you might not know is that you're actually blowing some killer time here when you could just do the bare minimum. You see, to get all the basic necessities you need, a couple of sticks and a wooden pickaxe for stone, all you need is about three to four logs at the start of the world. Seriously, everything past that is brownie points. An easy way to visualize it is that you only have to take down the blocks within an immediate radius of you. Past that, you got everything you need to get started and you can head on with the rest of the run. If you've been lucky enough to score some early game flint and iron, but you haven't been able to get so much in the food department, then making a flint and steel and going animal hunting is a great idea. Not only is this pretty fun as a pastime, but also it can give you some really high nutrition food. Which, since we're not getting much armor when we're moving quickly, that really can help to regen in some critical moments. So stitch together that flint and iron, find your pack of animals, and get ready to thank Prometheus for bringing fire to us humans. If you manage to find a village that generates with a cleric, then what you can do is work your way through the emerald market and get yourself some early game ender pearls. Partner this with the absurd amount of cash that you can get from other professions such as the Fletcher's stick trade, and this can be a pretty easy option to get all of your ender pearls without even having to look at an enderman. And since the village and pillage update gave us all the resources necessary to change these guys' jobs at will, if you've got a spare blaze rod or the flint for a fletching table, then this is definitely a great route to go on. Finding a fortress in the nether is the name of the game, but if you've already used up all your luck and now you're trying to find one of these structures off in the distance, what well, might be a good idea is to follow the lead of Hansel and Gretel and set up a breadcrumb trail of easy to mine blocks on your way to the new structure. That way, if you mess up and you need to change your direction, it's a lot easier to mine of sand than it is obsidian. And taking the extra seconds to lay out that yellow brick road can save you potential hours when you try to get back through your portal. When you reach another fortress, it might be easy to just grab the first blaze spawner that you see. But by doing that, you might take a short-term victory that hurts you in the long term. You see, if you can't, manage to find a blaze spawner that's surrounded by blocks, because that way it's so much easier. Because keep in mind, these mobs can fly, and I don't think any of us are looking at wasting our time or arrows to try and get a couple of blaze rods from the sky. So what I'm saying is, if you're looking for your blaze endeavors to go quick, you might want to find a hard top instead of a convertible roof. If you still don't have enough ender pearls by this point, then this is a speedrunner tactic that can be pretty helpful to game the system. What we're essentially doing here is setting up a soft reset button so that we can clean the board if we don't see the right mobs that we want to find. So to do that, we set up a pillar of 128 blocks or more, set our spawn at the top, and then jump down safely to the bottom. Then, when you're down there, check what mobs spawn, hopefully an enderman, look at them, and then fight them off. Following that, it's just a simple death with dignity by lava, and then you can respawn right at the top to do the whole process over again. And by manipulating the way that the mobs unload and respawn, we can really get some sweet amount of resources with this. As soon as you crack into the stronghold, it can be pretty difficult to find out where exactly the portal is. And since the eyes of Ender can only get you so far, most of us just rely to guesswork and figuring out the maze ourselves. Although, a key tactic to use that really turns this around is using Minecraft's audio subtitles in the accessibility menu. 
By using this feature, you no longer have to rely on just your ears, but you can also have a visual indicator as to not only what sound is playing, but exactly where it came from. Which can be pretty helpful if you're trying to scope out the lava or silverfish that you'll find in the stronghold. Which might be all you need to find that spawner and get one step closer to beating the Ender Dragon. Pillaring up to destroy the End Crystal Towers isn't always the safest bet. Though, by adding in the caged Crystal Towers, Mojang does try to force our hand a bit. Clearly, the arrows do no good here. However, if you get right up close to one of these things and stand right next to the pillar, you can use the powers of physics and gravity to get an arrow to hit that tower just right. And save yourself the trip of having to go up there and do it yourself. When fighting the Ender Dragon, most of the time we just take any hits that we can get. But if you're already standing underneath it and you're trying to get a little pickier, then it is worth mentioning that aiming for the dragon's head with your melee attacks actually gets more damage done. And hey, any excuse to dispatch this dragon and get done with the fight easier is fine by me. Just make sure to keep its noggin in your sight and land those hits right up until the end of the game. This is the deadliest cannon in Minecraft, and here's how to survive it. Since even though it's true that this design by Fallen Breath can kill the Ender Dragon in one shot, if we equip ourselves with Projectile Protection 4 Netherite Armor, a Potion of the Turtle Master, and an Enchanted Golden Apple, then it's also true that we can survive a hit from this thing. And we did it all without a totem, which to me seems a bit more impressive. But it's also true that the impossible part of this skill is getting all the materials necessary to do it. After all, it's not hard to stand still. And a much more difficult way of making yourself immortal is to do this trick to breathe underwater. Now, when you watch this glitch happen in first person, it might be hard to understand what's happening. But when we cut to a third person view, it gets a little bit more obvious. What's happening here is that the client and the server are desyncing every time we punch this fish. So while the client thinks that nothing changed and we can keep swimming as normal, according to the server, that punching cancels the sprint, and we stand up so that we can breathe above the air. And that little bit of desync will keep our head above water. But that trick works best on a server, whereas this one could work just as well on the client. With just an ender pearl and some precision, we could manage to walk through solid walls. To pull this off, we need to line up our ender pearl throw right at the bottom edge of the block. And once we do that, we sprint through, and after about one second, we come up the other side, giving us a great way to hide our secret base, or just to run away from your friends during a manhunt. But apparently, we're not the only ones that can go through walls. And if you want to get more complicated, it's also possible to shoot an arrow through a wall like this. As Doc M shows off, if you place an enderman inside of a boat and then position that next to a wall, then when you shoot an arrow at it, that arrow will have a chance to pass through the wall. And the reason for this is because once the arrow hits the Enderman, it ignores all other collision events for one tick after hitting it. Or kind of hitting it. After all, an arrow can't hit an Enderman, and apparently it can't hit this wall either. So if we tack a target block behind this wall, we could also get ourselves a secret button for a secret entrance. And it's a pretty good secret too. Not many people go around shooting Enderman, it usually doesn't work out so well. And what also never works out so well is mining this center block in a desert pyramid. But if we grab this cobweb, we can take after this user and actually pull off the perfect temple heist. All you have to do is when you mine into the treasure chamber, place this cobweb, and then slowly but surely loot all the chests before you hit that pressure plate. But hit that pressure plate we never will, because if we throw this ender pearl right before we open the last chest, we can launch ourselves right back out to the surface, leaving both us and the treasure chest intact. But that's not the last time we'll be using ender pearls, because over here, we can take after Simply Sark and do this impossible feat of crossing the end void gaps. We're just gonna need a few items to do it. And if you equip yourself the slow falling potion in an ender pearl like so, we can use a simple water launcher to blast off with a Riptide Trident, and then use all of that speed momentum to launch the Ender Pearl over the End Void Gap. And keep in mind, the islands in the end are roughly 225 blocks apart. And if we went any further, the Ender Pearl would be thrown far enough where it would unload if the player goes back to the starting island. So I'd say this is about as close to the maximum distance you can get out of one of these things. And it's a lot more impressive than just traveling the end in another Elytra. Speaking of another Elytra, to do this trick properly, we're gonna need two of them. Because once that first Elytra breaks midair, the real skill here is being able to switch out into another elytra before you hit the ground. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, this requires a very quick reaction time. But when you pull it off, it feels just as cool. And believe me, for as simple as this one sounds, it's not simple to pull off. And not to mention that by practicing it, you're putting yourself within seconds of death on the spot. And while we're talking about dying on the spot, this would be a good time to mention the anvil. Ask Rec Rap, it's not easy to kill someone with an anvil, and to kill a moving target with one is even more impossible. Not only do players move around much faster, but they also move around sporadically. So being able to plan out the proper trajectory to drop one of these on your foe, it's easier said than done. And the most important detail is that you really only get one shot to pull this off, because as soon as they notice an anvil dropping from the sky, they're gonna be a little suspicious. So if you want to be the safest with this, you should at least pre-break your anvil so that they destroy on the spot. Otherwise, that's 32 ingots worth of evidence that you're just leaving out there for them to see. But that's not even the hardest thing to aim, because if you really want a challenge, you should try to kill your friend with a drip stone. Though, not like this, but rather, by using a fishing rod, 
Mark, we're able to grab a fallen dripstone entity and then launch it towards our friends, which I'll mention is easy to do, but it's definitely hard to aim to get the kill. And unlike the anvil, we not only have to worry about where the player's position is going to be, but also the timing of when we reel in the dripstone. And when you're balancing that many things at once, it's pretty tough to pull off. And honestly, our best bet's to do like this user does and try and launch it towards someone who's on a lower pillar. That way they've at least got a stationary position. Is it easy? No, but a little more possible, and that's what I'll take. But even harder than trying to get that kill is try not to get killed yourself when you're mining with a wither. Now you might have seen in the past different people try to use withers to help them strip mine down in the deep slate, but what's even more difficult is trying to use a wither to help you mine for ancient debris. Now granted, they're not going to blow up the ancient debris, but with how low of a blast resistance that netherrack has, you're opening yourself up to a lot of trouble when you fight one of these things. And to be able to do this long enough for you're actually able to get some ancient debris, that's impressive. Because in our testing, it was hard to last more than a few seconds without dying to this thing, let alone long enough to get yourself a full netherite beacon. But even if you were able to pull this off and get all of the ancient debris you need, that still wouldn't be as hard as trying to cross a lava lake by just using boats. And folks, it only takes one look at Dream's manhunt to see just how impressive this is. Not only do you have to be precise in your timing to land all of these jumps, you also gotta time it just right where you're jumping off of the boats before they disintegrate in the lava. And the two of those together, it's a risky business. For one, you can only hold nine boats in your hop bar to pull this off. So even if you're able to do it, you're not able to do it for long. So make sure you get to your destination soon enough to dismount. But if that jump is difficult because of how dangerous it is, this one's even more difficult just because of how stupid it is to pull off. Well, that is entirely true that if you spam jump quick enough, you could use that to propel yourself with an elytra. The trouble then comes in depending on what server you're running on. So if you're trying this on your friend's laggy server that's a continent away, it's gonna be a lot easier than it is to do on your single player client. But once you nail the timing, this is a way to fly around without the use of things like rockets or tridents. And while you might consistently learn how to pull off a jump or two, the difficult part's learning how to master this in a couple of different trials. Especially when most of the time, whether it works or not comes down to a random factor. And that's not the only skill we need server lag to do. Because to pull off the impossible feat of speed bridging with gravity blocks, we're gonna need a lot of lag. And probably a macro too. In this example, we're using the carpet mod to simulate lag in the map. And you'll notice that the better that you are at bridging, overall the less lag that you'll need. And really to pull off this trick without using any lag, you would have to move at a speed faster than what's possible in survival mode. Which is impressive for sure, but it kind of defeats the point. And that's not the last time you're gonna have to worry about your speed. Because if you go too fast trying this elytra trick, it's not gonna end so well for you or the mobs. And truly, trying to carry another mob by using an elytra in a lead is almost guaranteed to end with one of the leads snapping and a pile of mob drops on the floor below. But it's also incredibly useful if you need to move mobs far distances, especially without the use of a nether portal. So if you wanna pull this off with the best odds that you have, you'll wanna look out for a cliff or a body of water so that you can gradually increase the speed and then you can use a rocket to avoid the lead snapping. I would also make sure that you got a body of water that you can land in on the other end. Otherwise, you'll have brought that naturally generated pink sheep all this way just for it to end up as pink wool on the other end. But even if water's able to save us here, it's not gonna do so much with this next skill. Because if you were to find yourself falling into the end void, the water isn't gonna move fast enough for your friend to drop a water bucket for you. But if you got the skill, it is possible, but definitely difficult, to save yourself from falling by throwing an ender pearl. But not only does the timing on this have to be precise, but the angle does too. So maybe take up a course in trigonometry before you try this. Oh, and also make sure that you have plenty of health before you try it too. Because nothing's gonna be more pathetic than landing that ender pearl clutch, only to take the two and a half hearts worth of fall damage and die there on the spot. And if you don't want to worry about fall damage at all, then you should try this glitch. As you can see from this user, if we were to sprint jump and then keep holding jump on the way down for our fall, then it's possible to save ourselves from all fall damage if we hit crouch right before hitting the ground, which is a random set of steps and they're easier said than done. But if you pull it off right, you can survive a fall from any height without ever having to touch a water bucket. Though keep in mind, if you're gonna try this, only do it on 1.19.2, since the glitch seems to have been shadow patched in 1.19.3. But if you still want to impress your friends on the latest release, then grab yourself a couple of gravity blocks. Since with some incredibly precise timing, we're able to use gravity blocks placed underneath us to jump across this gap while hugging onto the wall. But obviously, since we're using gravity blocks here, we're not the only ones falling, so you have to be able to jump on the gravity block before it falls. And if you want to be even more impressive here, then the real secret is to try and use this trick to go up in elevation, or even just stay at the same Y level. Really, as long as you're not falling into the pit, you're doing it right in my eyes. And while that skill is a pain to try and jump further, this one uses pain to try and jump higher. Since if you're willing to take a beating, it is possible to use damage knockback to jump higher. And while it's much easier to try and use this to get an extra half a block to your jump, if you're going for the gold post, then the one that you really got to use is the two block jump. So how do we even do this? Well, it's gonna be easiest to pull off with fire. Since when you light yourself ablaze, you're getting constant damage ticks that we can use here. But worth noting is that you don't have to place the fire ahead of time. Since by just carrying around a flint and 
steel and then lighting a fire mid-jump, you'll get the same effect. Which is good. Now you don't have to worry about the fire. It's just an impossible timing. Which maybe isn't a relief, but it's at least only one thing to worry about. And even though fire makes this skill feel pretty painful, unfortunately this one with a water bucket isn't any easier. Now, from a glance, this looks like it should be pretty easy to pull off, right? There's the standard water bucket clutch. But the real sticking point here is that the floor is made up of blocks that we are able to waterlock. So even if we nail the timing just like we usually would, we're just gonna waterlog the block and die on impact. So the way that you get around this, that you have to place down a regular block first and then water on top of that. Which sounds simple, but it's extremely difficult to do while falling. And the way that you know this one's tough is that even if you have a right click macro, this is still almost impossible to do in survival. And especially if you were to try to do something like this in actual practice, I'm not sure many of us would be able to do this with the proper setup, let alone without it. And while this water bucket challenge makes it easy to kill ourselves, this next one proves that it's even tougher to kill other people. Once you get a rainstorm overhead, if you equip yourself with a Riptide 3 Trident and Elytra, we're able to pull off the coolest trick shot in history. But watch closely, because if you blink, you might miss it. Since once we get a rainstorm overhead, we're able to use this setup to get ourselves launching at over 400 blocks per second. And at that point, it's difficult to land anything, let alone a headshot. But once you do, you'll notice that this is able to one-shot someone with Protection 4 Netherite Armor. And in our testing, we found that if they're wearing Projectile Protection 4, this will still get them down to one heart. And who knows, with more precise timings, there's still a chance that we could get this in one shot. And that way, we basically turn ourselves into a flying version of the Rail Cannon. And while the bow shot's tough because of how unpredictable players are, you'll find this jump is tough just because of how unpredictable the game is. As Yuzu Legitimus shows off, with the right setup, we're able to use this glitch with a slime block to essentially bounce higher than where we started from. And the key here comes down to the client server desync. Because while one of them thinks we hit the ground, the other one thinks we bounce. And the result is that we get launched super high. And while some setups of this trick make it easier to do, others like this one require a great deal of precision. And with any of them, you're gonna find that it's hard to do consistently on the fly. Especially when there's these times where you think you made a jump because of how high you get launched, but it turns out it still wasn't high enough. Making parkour with these, some of the hardest I've ever had to do. But it's still not the hardest jump for parkour. No, because that award has to go to this jump. And while this user makes it look easy, the truth is not as simple as that. And the way that it works is that if you turn exactly 45 degrees midair, that'll allow you to move around 2% faster. Sounds small, right? But in examples like this, that could be all you need to make the jump. Since while a normal walking speed would be 4.317 blocks per second, when you're strafe walking, that goes up to 4.405 blocks per second. And just by that small margin, we're able to make this jump that we couldn't otherwise. And to even try this, first you're gonna need to jump, sprint, and hold forward at the exact same time. And then you'll hold that right up until the last jump, where you then only have a short amount of time to start strafing back and forth. But that alone isn't enough. Since to really pull this off, you have to look as close to 45 degrees to the side as possible. And when you put all that together, you get the hardest jump that we've been able to do in this video. But wait, there's still one more. Because this trick is so impossible that you literally have to use a tool-assisted speedrun software to make it happen. And as you'll see from this video from Cinemal, to pull this off, we first have to position ourselves at the edge of the block, and then continue sliding back and forth on it, all the while while placing flint and steel, until we're eventually able to pull off this skill to be able to pillar up 50% faster. And the reason this all happens is because when the player jumps on the edge of a block, it'll cause the internal server of the single player to think that the player hasn't jumped at all. So when you take damage in this state, things get a little weird. And to be able to set up a task to even do this is tough enough. So if you're able to do this skill by yourself, take this crown, you deserve it. If you've ever tried to get a skeleton hit a creeper, then you know it's not an easy task. But it's a necessary one if we want to fill out our music disc collection. So we'll have to get creative. And luckily, this user has the right idea. See, Minecraft counts assists the same way that it does kills. Meaning, if we have a skeleton shoot a piece of TNT, ignite it, and then that kills the creeper, we'll get the music disc the same way. And with that, folks, YouTube thinks that you might like this video. So see if they're right and have a good one. All right.